We left off last week talking about the Israelites being freed from Egyptian captivity. Uh, they were brought out into the wilderness. They were given the Ten Commandments. And we're going to pick up that conversation this week. There is a theme that I'm not going to point to specifically yet, but you're going to see it over the next few weeks. There's a theme with the Israelites uh, in, the, in the wilderness. And the theme is they complain a lot. There's a lot of grumbling. There's a very quick process from seeing the glory and miraculous intervention of God to complaining and wondering why they've been abandoned. It is this back and forth that happens throughout the Old Testament. Um, so they go the, uh, from getting the Ten, Commandment, Ten Commandments. They're now moving towards the promised land. Uh, in terms of geography, with a small group of people to go from where they were to where they were supposed to be should have taken a couple of weeks. They had a million people making this, this uh, 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 gap with them. So it probably should have taken a month, maybe two months, to go from where they got the Ten Commandments to where uh, the promised land was. Uh, that process ended up for these people taking 40 years. And today we're going to look at why it took 40 years. We're, in, we're going to be in the book of Numbers. I'm going to get some specific moments here in just a second. But this portion of the Bible story, the Israelites wandering in the desert, create or, or contains, honestly, some of the saddest, uh, most painful accounts in the entire Bible narrative. There's some really hard, gut-wrenching stuff in it. But what it does for us, at least my hope, as we're reading through this, is that it wakes us up to the reality that despite our grumbling, despite our missteps, despite our mistakes, God continues to be with his people. Um, our text is going to come from Numbers 13 specifically. We're going to do something a little different with the text um, in just a minute. But if you want to go ahead and get to Numbers 13, that's where we're going to be. Uh, but I do want to, I want to dwell for just one second. The Israelites complain a lot. Uh, that is a human condition. They also struggle to trust God with big things. Also a human condition. So let me start. This is my, this is my warm-up question. If you're new with me, I, I, need, I need to hear from you in order to build the class because you do, you're already getting one sermon today. You don't need another one. So let me ask a question that will probably be the easiest question for you to answer. The only question is whether or not you want to raise your hand and say it. But it's the easiest one to answer. Um, the Israelites complained a lot. What do we complain about most? In the church, in terms of just your church existence, what do you get, what do you what do you complain about the most? What do you hear complaints about the most? <coughs> Again, you all had thoughts immediately. Just whether or not you want to raise your hand and say them. Participation. Breezy, keep talking. What? I like what you just said, that what teaching classes, there's never enough and there's always too many. Um, yeah, as, as, yes, great answer. I was going to expound, but I don't need to. What else? What else we can complain about in church? All the time. I will tell you of all the complaints that, that, that I get to hear, that's probably, that's in the top three. Um, it's, it's a, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's too something. Good. What else? In you don't have a time to go because you're busy with everything else. Okay. Good. Good. So not, not, not having a church schedule that fits my schedule. I like that. That's good. What else? My wife says that you've got too many choices. She's got to give us so many classes to be able to attend this class. Uh-huh. You know, that's how it's always been. Uh, I, I appreciate, I so appreciate you rolling her right under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the fact that there's too many choices and you have to pick one. No, that's, first of all, that may be my favorite complaint I've ever heard. Uh, I don't know that I've ever had somebody say, you guys have so many awesome things that I can't pick one. So I'm just going to stop right there because that's the best complaint I've ever heard. Uh, I want to differentiate before we get into this conversation because there is a weird, there's a weird human element here. Um, I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess that my two sons are not the only two children who complain a lot. Uh, I'm going to guess yours probably do too. Right? I'm going to guess they probably have concerns, and I'm also going to guess they probably don't drop those in a suggestion box and then wait patiently for you to address them at a time that's convenient for you. Right? So I want to differentiate for just a second. How do we, how do we tell the difference between complaining 
and expressing a real concern. And I say that because it, the, people who, the people who complain the most um, do not recognize that they're complaining the most. Uh, the people who complain the most oftentimes are, are expressing a real and genuine concern in their mind. And then it comes to my ears and I hear, you're complaining a lot. Uh, so what's the difference? How do we differentiate between the two? And I'm, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess it's the same for you and your homes. Um, this is not meant to disparage our church family. Let's disparage our kids. So, uh, so it's, about, it's about telling the difference between complaining and expressing a real concern. I wanna give you just a thought to think through as parents and also to think through as, you know what, as human beings, you get all the ammunition you need to complain every day, it's gonna be there. So how do we tell the difference? Uh, it, just in my personal opinion, Complaining is generally rooted in preference and self. It's rooted in things that I prefer and I'm taking care of me. It's about my comfort. That's what you see a lot with the Israelites. You see, you see complaining about comfort and about self, uh, preference. Um, their concerns are generally rooted in, in their own uh, well-being. Uh, concerns, like real legitimate deep concerns are usually the opposite of that. They're rooted in the well-being of some collective group. Um, people who are complaining uh, generally already know what solution they want. Okay, so when you hear complaints, it's often a complaint with, I already know how I want this problem solved. Um, and if your child is complaining about something and has a solution in mind, um, you can probably identify that as a complaint. A genuine concern is a genuine concern for a problem which leaves open the possibility of multiple ways to solve it. Does that make sense? So if, if within the church, uh, if you have an issue or a concern and you don't have a preference as to how it gets solved but you would like to see a problem addressed in some way, you're probably expressing a deep concern and you are worried about the well-being of others because it's not your preferred outcome you're looking for. It's a solution to a problem. If you just want to sing older songs because you miss them, I get that, but that's more about you than it is about solving a bigger problem. Does that make sense? All right, I say that because being able to articulate that difference. I want my, my two boys, they're nine and five. I want them to be able, I want them to be able to express to me legitimate concerns. But I also want to be able to identify in them when they are complaining. Um, so that's a big difference to make. That thought just popped in my head as I was preparing for our, our conversation this morning. Um, in addition to that, we complain a lot, but we also struggle, just like the Israelites did, to trust God with our lives. Um, we struggle to trust God because we struggle to not be in control. So that's where we're going to be. We're going to be in Numbers 13. Okay, so this, this part of the narrative, Israelites have left, uh, have gotten the Ten Commandments, and they are moving towards the Promised Land. Um, I want to focus on a few specific moments of this narrative, but I'm going to do it in kind of a weird way. I'm going to read this story to you from the children's Bible. And the reason I'm going to do it is because Numbers 13, if you want to look through it, it starts uh, by kind of setting up what's about to happen. And then you have the long passage where we're split, we give the names of all 12 of the men who are going to go into the promised land. Um, and then this is a long story. It's a long account. The children's Bible version of it shortens it to enough to where you understand the overarching theme in what's happening. Uh, now, I'm going to pull out specific passages. We're not going to replace the Bible with the children's Bible today. Uh, but, by the way, this is the story for children. This is the same lesson your kids are getting. Um, this is a really good way to introduce the Bible story to kids. So I highly recommend this for your kids. All right, so I'm going to read the, the children's version of Numbers 13. So if you want to try and follow along with me, you're welcome to. Or if you want to just wait for just a minute while Uncle Ryan reads a story, uh, you're welcome to do that. Too. After traveling in the wilderness, Moses and the Israelites reached the edge of Canaan, the land God had promised his people. The weary travelers were excited to know their journey was almost over. Moses called the people together. Before we enter this promised land, we must send explorers to learn about the land and the people who live there, he said. Moses chose 12 explorers and gave them instructions. Go south and then to the mountains, he said. See what the land looks like. Is the, rich, is the soil rich for planting? Are there lots of trees? Are the people weak or strong? What are the towns like? Are they open like camps or do they have walls? The 12 explorers packed up and off they went. They searched and looked and investigated for 40 days. Then they returned to Moses with a report. The land is awesome, said the explorers. The soil is good for planting. Just taste these wonderful fruits we found. Grapes, pomegranates, and figs. 
They shared their treasures with the people. The Israelites couldn't wait to enter the land, and excitement grew among the people. But when Moses asked about the Canaanites who lived in the new land, the explorers began to disagree. Ten were fearful and told the others, we can't go there. The cities are huge, and they have tall walls around them. The people are big and strong. Some are as big as giants. They will kill us if we try to take their land, they cried. The fears of the ten explorers quickly spread through the camp. We were better off back in Egypt living as slaves, the people protested. We're going to go back to that verse in just a minute. But two explorers, Caleb and Joshua, were not afraid. They were strong and brave, and they trusted God. We can do it. We can take the land. The Lord is on our side. Don't be afraid of the people. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Despite all the good things God had done for his people, the people did not believe Caleb and Joshua. God was angry with the Israelites' lack of faith. Moses pleaded with God to forgive the people. God listened to Moses and agreed to forgive. But God did not allow his people to enter the land for another 40 years. Okay, I wanted to read that from the kids' Bible because I wanted you to get an overarching view of this story. Now, we're going to pull out some very specific passages. Uh, but I want to start with a question. Moses has just sent spies out into the land to do some recon on the land that God has promised them. It's a weird question, but I want to start here. What kind of report, based on what we just read, what kind of report do you think the people were expecting to get? They seem surprised by the report they got. What report do you think they were expecting to get? Now, keep in mind, this is the land God has promised them. This is going to be given to them. Spies, go into the land to look to see what it looks like, this land that's been promised to them. In your mind, what were those people expecting to hear when they asked what the land looks like? Okay, so um, that's, that's what I was thinking too. So let me ask a question. I, this is less of a question than it is a response, right? So sometimes I want to try to ask you a question. Sometimes I want to put a statement into the world and let you play with that statement. So I want to get your thoughts on the following statement, okay? Christians are generally surprised when they learn that following the path of God is challenging and scary. That is the statement I'm going to make. G Christians are generally surprised when they find that following God is difficult and scary. Uh, true, false, and give me your thoughts on that statement. It may be true for the, the new Christian. He's accepted Christ. He's, he's going to follow that. Yeah. He, he don't know what he's going to accept for. I mean, later on, yeah. he does know. I think part of spiritual maturity is the knowledge that, that statement is inaccurate. And I would love to say it's just a new Christian. I'm not sure it is. I think it should be, but I'm not sure it is. Jose, you had thoughts? Well, I think it's, uh, when we think about it, when we don't Christ, what is the purpose of coming to Christ? Mm -hmm. It's just for establishing that relationship. Okay. It's knowing, giving, the mind, all the pain and suffering and whatever's holding us to the, like Paul said, like the body of death. Yeah. Yep. And now that we have that, we're all the expectations at that point are just all rainbows and roses and yeah. unicorns flying. Yeah. But the reality is, I, I couldn't agree with that statement more. I think, I think it's a, um, I think it's a natural part of of our thinking. It's a natural part of our simplistic view of faith and spirituality when we, when we adopt it, which is, um, despite, again, despite everything that we've been told and despite everything we see in Scripture, this uh, almost intrinsic feeling like it's a suit of armor that's going to protect us against trial. And, and tribulation, and it's it's to me, it's really encouraging um, to remember that that's not the case. And I know that sounds weird. It's encouraging to remember that's not the case because it it, it allows us in moments where we struggle the most to recognize that that's when um, that's when God really gets to work uh, on us. But I think there's this weird perception uh, in the good moments that the more faithful I can be, the less likely it is that I'm going to have to deal with bad stuff. 
All right, I say that because there's something that is intrinsically true to me about, um, about our human nature, and that is that whether it's church involvement or whether it's faith and spirituality, period, we have a weird tendency when things are hard to pull back from it, to withdraw from it until things get better again, and then we re-engage. Uh, I think that is a natural tendency, uh, but I want to make sure that I'm clear on the fact that uh, these people, the Israelite people, who, the Israelite people who had this expectation, God has a plan for us. And so because God has a plan that we're going to enter the promised land, we're going to get there, and, and the, the, the people are all going to be tiny, and they're all going to have little toothpicks. I imagine reap a cheat from, although that would be a bad analogy for this, if you've read the Chronicles of Narnia in the last 30 years. Um, I, the little, they're all going to be little mice men, and we're going to be able to walk in and just kick them over. Uh, no, and in fact, um, God's strength is really on display in the fact that the, the Canaanites were huge, and it was going to require divine intervention. All right, so we're going to go back to that theme over the course of the next few weeks, but I wanted to start it now. All right, let's move on. Uh, the Israelites are on the cusp of taking the promised land, and at the last minute, they pull back. Do me a favor. Take a look at chapter 13, verses 26 through 33. So take a look at that little section right there. In that section, you have the answer to my following question. I want you to find it. What specific fear stops the Israelites dead in their tracks? They're, they're moving towards the promised land. The promised land is right in front of them, and there's a specific fear that they see, and it happens in these few verses. What are they afraid of that pro prompts them to stop? That's not a trick question, by the way. We've already said it more than once. The size of the giants. Thank you. Mark. They're bigger than us. They're stronger than us. They're going to defeat us, and it's going to be ugly. It's going to be a bloodbath, right? All right, let me ask a weird question. What are Christians today most fearful of? Thank you, Mark, for catching where I was going with that. What are Christians today most fearful of? You can answer. Thank you. Okay. Uh huh. Why are we afraid of speaking up? They're bigger than us. They're louder than us. They're stronger than us. They're more culturally in tune than us. Their followings are bigger on social media. Uh, the, the, the depiction we see here of the Israelite people being afraid of the giants is no less applicable to us today than it's ever been in my lifetime. And that is, as Christians, we are still afraid of giants. We're still afraid of all the big people in our culture who we're afraid are going to embarrass us for our beliefs. That's why we don't speak up enough. That's why we don't, we don't, we're not as overt with our faith as we think we should be, as we know that we should be. It's oftentimes because we are in a very weird cultural moment where um, I had a conversation with a neighbor yesterday. Uh, most of us in this room, there's a couple of you who are, who are young enough to where you may not remember this, and I realize that's a super old man statement I just made. Uh, but I, most of us in this room are, are old enough to remember when there was a pretty safe expectation, uh, when you encountered a random person in the South, in Texas, a random person, there was a pretty safe expectation that that person had been exposed to Christianity and probably, statistically, was likely to believe it. Um, we are moving in a very bizarre direction where that is not necessarily an assumption that you can make anymore. Um, and we're afraid because it seems like the outside culture is getting bigger and it's getting stronger and it's getting scarier. So I say that because we are still afraid of the big people and I want to encourage us not to be. So here is my question. What were the spies focused on? The 10 who, with the negative report, what were they focused on? They were focusing on what they could see, and they were focusing on the obstacles. What were Caleb and Joshua focusing on? Focusing on God. So there's this theme that we started with the conversation with Moses. This uh, conversation we started with Moses was that Moses kept talking about himself. Remember, go back to the burning bush. Uh, Moses argued with God about whether or not he was the right guy to exercise this thing that God had told him to do. 
Um, and Moses kept making it about Moses. He kept talking about his inability to do things. God's response to that every time was, yeah, I know, but I'm really big. His response was to encourage Moses to stop thinking about Moses and start thinking about God. We see in this moment the exact same problem. The same problem is we've got ten spies who focus on the people and focus on these people that they're, they're, they've been promised they're going to take this land, but they're focusing on the obstacles. Caleb and Joshua are focusing on God. Um, there is a lesson for us in that. Uh, there is – you can even use the, the, um, the story of, uh, of Peter walking on the water. When he loses, takes his focus off of Jesus and moves to the obstacles, he begins to sink. This is a theme throughout the Bible. When your life gets hard, you focus on the obstacles, and you are guaranteed to sink. You are guaranteed to struggle. Uh, the more you focus your life on God, the more likely you are uh, to get where God wants you to go. All right, so in moments of trial, focus less on the obstacles and more on God, which brings us to another point. Uh, the Israelites struggle to trust God. We do too sometimes. That's a theme we've been talking about through this class. We struggle to trust God with our lives. So let me ask a very weird therapist-y kind of question, right? I don't, like, I don't like just bringing struggles that we have into the conversation. I want to also have active conversations about how to grow in certain areas. So let me ask a very bizarre question. How does one grow in their trust in God? So I got a lot of you in this room who may be thinking, okay, yeah, I've, I'm struggling or I've struggled or I'm going to struggle. It's great. It sounds great. Focus on God. Trust God more. But I don't know how to do that. So for those of you in this room who may be asking that question, let's crowdsource this just a bit. How does one grow their trust in God? If you imagine trust as a discipline to be practiced, how do you get better at it? Keep talking. Yeah. Can I tell you, Courtney, why I appreciate that so much? We waste a lot of time in life trying to make the right decision. Um, I, I, I try to tell my kids, don't worry about making the right decision. If there's usually, usually, let me rephrase that. Usually our choices are not between good and evil. Now, when the answer is good and evil, there's a right choice. But usually it's, it's between, you know, McDonald's or Arby's. Those are, there's not a, you can argue both of those are kind of evil. But, but there's not generally a right, there's not a good and evil type conversation, right? Um, so when we're in that situation, I try to tell my kids, don't worry about making the right decision. Make a decision and then make it the right decision. And you make it the right decision by committing to it. Uh, by engaging as best you can with it and, and trying to treat it uh, the right way and not constantly second-guessing whether you made the wrong decision. Um, yeah, Felicia, what do you got? Um, I was in a Bible study a couple of weeks ago, and it was basically a line to what you were saying. Mm. I think part of that trust is patience, too. I, I think we, we, we will trust God for a, there's a time frame. Like he's, got a, he's on a clock. And if he doesn't give us something definitive, by the time our clock expires, we assume we're either being ignored or we'll just decide he's telling me to do this. Uh, and we, we mistake conviction with impatience. And through that respecting, that's where you grow. Absolutely. Because Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think that's beautifully stated. Say that last sentence again. I'm going to make you do it exactly like you just did. <laughs> you were growing in you growing in your patience. There you go. Felicia, I'm going to I'm going to keep you on the spot. I'm going to make you do it. You talk about. <laughs> Yeah. And that's where the of Absolutely. Absolutely. 
I appreciate it. You know what? You having to dwell on it, though, was good for everybody because I think you were hitting on the core, the core value that I think separates, um, um, separates those who are able to struggle as a part of a process and those who let that struggle destroy them. Um, it's hard. Look, I, I, it's, it's easy for us in a Sunday morning class to talk theoretically about be patient, trust the process, engage in the process. I, I'm, not, I'm not insensitive to the fact when you're in the middle of it, you want it to stop and it hurts. And I get it. Um, but here's the thing. I, 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 don't have a, I don't have a quick fix for you. Um, nothing I'm saying, nothing we're saying in this room um, is dependent on what level of pain you're, you're experiencing. All right, what else? How do you trust in God? How do you, how do you grow your trust in God? Great process. Prayerfully praying about it, you can make a decision and you can feel confident about it. That even if it's a mistake, you can later say, okay, God, I didn't have all the information I needed. Or I did the best I could with the information I had. There you go. I, I so appreciate you talking about regret. And the reason I appreciate you talking about regret is regret is, is very often. Now, not there's sometimes it's for a different reason, but it's very often because we put new information on old decisions. Um, and so we look back and say, well, I shouldn't have done that because of all this new information I've got. And I get that. I get that. That's informative. But where, it, where, it, where regret is a problem for me is... Um, we do the best, we make the best choice we can with the information we have available to us at the time. Um, and we can't retroactively with new information go back and no. Yeah. I love it. Well, so for me too, I, I like the idea of the goal is not to try and, and the goal is not always to try to reconcile past decisions. The goal is to try and make sure that right now, today, I'm as spiritually healthy as I can be, that I'm the best version of me that I can be. If I can go self-help for just a minute, um, if, if today, if I'm happy with who I am now, if I'm content with who I am now, if I feel, if I feel useful with who I am now, everything that led me here has to be a good thing, even the things that were hard, even the things that I wished hadn't happened. And I say that a lot in premarital counseling. So when I'm doing premarital counseling, one of the things that we struggle with is people's past. And one of the things I encourage all the time is if you love the person sitting next to you, and if the answer is yes, then you, everything that they've been through, everything they've experienced created the person who you fell in love with. And had any of those things not happened, they might be a completely different person. And then I get a lot of deer in the headlights looks from, uh, from people who don't like what I just said. All right, um, how else do you grow your trust in God? There's one thing, let's look specifically at the Israelites. When you see them not trusting God and you think of their story, what's just happened to them? The, are these not the same people who were literally in slavery just like a, like a minute ago? Are these not the same people who watched the Red Sea get parted so they could walk across it? I like to think of us as human beings, that if I saw that, whatever comes next, I trust it, uh, whatever. It could be the land we're going to take is a bunch of knife-fighting gorillas. I, they're huge, whatever. I can, we can do this. It's the fact that they, they had so quickly forgotten the things that God's already done for them. All right, so let me ask you a question. Do you, as a family, do you ever sit down and say out loud with your kids, with your spouse, Let's talk about all the amazing things that God has done in our life. Because we have this weird tendency to focus on the things we want or to focus on the things that we're not getting. But we have a weird, we have a weird aversion to spending time where our entire conversation is, um, what's God done for us? What does that do? It reminds you that God is working in your life. It reminds you that God is present and available to you. It reminds you that those moments that you thought were hard and ugly, some of, I think back to my own family history, some of the moments that I was the angriest about, some of the moments that were the most hurtful, uh, in retrospect, yeah, they, I, could, I can see it. I can see God working 
in my life, working in my family's life. Um, so I say that because one of the best ways that we can grow in our, uh, our, our, our trust is to remember the things that God has done for you. Yes, you've had struggles. Yes, you've had hard moments. You may be going through a hard moment right now. God has done amazing things in your life. Uh, here's a fun little practice, a little habit that you should get into if you haven't done it already. Um, I, and I realize that this sounds kind of hokey. Uh, I'll remind you that I'm a therapist, so I do hokey things a lot. Uh, we've got a little book, a little notebook that's about this big that sits in a basket in our, in our kitchen, our living room, um, on the little stand between our, our recliner and our couch. Um, it's our blessings journal. And at random times, uh, everyone in the family, your job is at least once a week, once or twice a week, to pick up that notebook and write down something that you notice that you're thankful for that God's done for you. When you're having a rough day, let me tell you the greatest place to go, to go to your blessings journal and start flipping through pages, to see my little kid's handwriting to see that I'm grateful that we had a good day outside today. Uh, it makes those muddy, rainy, nasty days feel a lot better. And I mean that both literally and metaphorically. All right, uh, so I want to move on. There is a, uh, goodness, there's two points I want to hit. I'm going have to have to hit them really quickly. Chapter 14, verses 2 through 4. Stay with me for just a second. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. I'm in chapter 14. Um, the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by, sword, by the sword? Our wives and little ones would become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? These people are now pining to go back to slavery because life has gotten hard and it's going to be challenging. I'm going to say this, and I could do an entire class on it. I've got two minutes. So in those two minutes, let me just say this. Do not underestimate the power of consistency and normalcy. And here's what I mean. You can get very comfortable in dysfunction. You can get very comfortable in misery. You can get very comfortable in depressive symptoms so much so that living without them sounds terrifying. Uh, clinically speaking, I have worked with people who so define themselves by their dysfunction and by their, so I'm gonna use this phrase. They define themselves by their depressive symptomology to the point that they don't know how to be somebody who doesn't have that depressive symptomology and so they can't ever be free of it. Because if they're free of it, they lose who they are. I won't give you the entire analogy. Remember Shawshank Redemption? Remember Brooks? Brooks is my perfect example for how dysfunction can be comfortable. He spent his entire life in prison, and the moment he got freedom, he couldn't handle it because being in prison was way more comfortable. If you think your brain is not capable of doing that, you are underestimating how powerful your brain is. You can get very comfortable in dysfunction. You know people in your life, and I'm assuming it's people in your life and it's not you, but you know people in your life who seem to have to invent problems when they don't have them? It's because they've defined themselves as somebody who's always in crisis. That's where they find meaning. It's where they find value. And once they've defined themselves that way, guess what the worst, scariest thing in the world is? Not having problems. And if you don't know how to define yourself in any other way, it is really tempting to go back to slavery uh, because freedom is scary. Okay, again, I could, I could keep talking, but I'm already ranting enough. I want to point to one last thing. How did the story end? The story ended because of the lack of faith of the Israelites. They were not permitted to enter the promised land. And in fact, every adult over the age of 20 was going to die before the Israelites were given uh, the promised land. And the reason that that's really important is because there is a truth in this story that I don't want us to miss. Um, after being punished... The Israelites tried really hard to correct their mistake and go, no, we're ready now. What, you're right. God said we can't go in, so let's, let's go and, and, and try to do the thing that God told us we could do. And God does not bless that process. And the reason for that is because uh, God will always forgive us. Grace is a powerful, powerful thing, and it is readily available to all who seek it. But there are always consequences for sin. And that is something we see in this story it is something that as churches we don't like to talk about because it feels oppressive. Um, I want to make sure that you parent in the way that you see God parenting his children in this passage. Okay, Parents, if you're listening, grace is freely offered. Forgiveness is freely offered. But the consequences of sin stay. There are consequences. Grace is offered with consequences. And I say that because if we can parent in that same way, I will always forgive you. I will always love you. I will always, I will always be there for you. But you broke a rule. 
and my consequence that I've given you has to stay, no matter how sweet and adorable your little beaming eyes are, no matter how much you cry, no matter how much you learn exactly what mom needs to hear or exactly what dad needs to hear, no matter how much you hear those things, I love you, I forgive you, I won't hold it against you, I won't use it against you next time, but there's consequences for mistakes. That is a truth that I think we could probably stand as Christians to hit on a little harder. Uh, grace is wonderful and grace feels really, really good, but we're doing a disservice to the world when we don't also speak openly about the fact that sin does have consequences. All right, I appreciate you being here this morning. We are doing this every week, so please come back and see us again next week. Uh, really quickly, I'm going to pray for you, and then we will call it a day. If you would, bow with me. Gracious Father, Lord, I come to you today grateful for the opportunity that you give us to worship together, for the opportunity that you give us to spend time together in your word and with brothers and sisters. Uh, Father, I pray for this assembled group of people. I pray for their families. I pray for their children. I pray for their spouses. I pray for their day-to-day -day lives. And Father, the thing that I pray for uh, most of all is that they be brought back to you in every opportunity, that they be reminded of your glory in every opportunity, uh, and that they remember their true purpose and true calling, no matter how complicated the world gets. Father, I ask these things through yourself. Amen. Thank you much. I'll see you next time.